you should have received a handout. If you didn't, raise your hands and uh, one of the ushers will bring you one. We're not going to look at it, but um, later on we will. All right, so Acts chapter 18. Let's go over and take a look at that. Um, there are different ways of teaching through the Bible. You can teach verse by verse. You can teach uh, clump by clump. You can teach a, a topic out of a chapter. Um, sometimes if you, if you have a Bible school background, you understand the, the, um, the, the concept of survey. Uh, I don't mean a 50,000-foot survey, but uh, a survey. So we're going we're gonna to move quickly through, Lord willing, through these two chapters, 18 and 19. Uh, Paul is on his second missionary journey. Uh, Mindy, if you can put that up on the second missionary journey map. I brought a laser. Uh, I, I, I was driving around today and I thought I should go to Staples. I should buy lasers for these guys who keep complaining they don't have one. They can all afford one. But anyhow, um, so uh, this is uh, the second journey. Uh, Paul, again, you know, everything starts, well, really in Jerusalem, but Antioch is the church up in Syria. And from there, they've gone back across uh, the, the Asian plain, we'd call it Turkey today. So uh, out through Galatia uh, and, uh, and then up across the top. And they've crossed on over now into Europe at Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Berea, uh, and then, or, or Thess Thessalonica, Berea and then on down to Athens. That's a long hike. Uh, and now Paul's going to leave Athens, head over to Corinth. He's going to leave Corinth, head across the Aegean Sea to Ephesus. This will be his first time in Ephesus. And then that'll be the end of the second journey, and then he'll come back. He wants to come back for the feast. Most people assume he means the feast of uh, Passover. So he'll land at uh, Caesarea, go up to Jerusalem for the feast, and then on up from Damascus to Antioch, and then from there be sent out again on the third journey. Sounds real easy. You look at chapters, you look at verses, but we're talking about years that they're out. Again, they're not taking a bus, they're not flying, uh, they didn't rent a car. They, uh, they, they're traveling thousands of miles on foot, we presume. Does someone have a mule? Maybe. But, you know, this is slow going. Uh, there are bandits, there's all sorts of, of obstacles and hazards along the way that I, I think, it's just my conviction, um, but uh, and, and when I say it's my conviction, I don't mean because I, I just look at your smiling faces and I can tell you probably don't get it. No, what I mean is you probably think, and this is not an insult, but you probably think like I do, and you know, we just go verse to chapter and blah, 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 and we don't, we don't think about the time that these things are taking. Or that, you know, when it says, well, they left, uh, they left Philippi and they went to uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia. Well, that's 75 miles. They didn't, that's, a, that's a verse. That's one sentence. But 75 miles, how long does it take you to walk 75 miles? Same as it took them, you know, in sandals. And uh, so it's, it's good to, it, uh, one of, the, one of the, the best things we can do in Studying the Bible on our own, whether you're going to study to learn about it or you're going to study to learn in order to teach it, is the, the old principle is to try to put ourselves in the sandals of the people who are doing it. Try to imagine what the smells were like. What were the bathroom facilities like? What was the food like? You know, this is a, Paul is, Paul is a, a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a very kosher man, and he's learned he doesn't have to, he, 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 say, he says later on, he'll, he'll write in to the Corinthians that, you know, uh, to, the, to, to, to the Jews I became a Jew, to the Greek I became a Greek, I become all things to all men. So he's eating their food. What do you think they're eating? What kind of snakes and lizards? Seriously, these are poor people scrounging, scrounging. And uh, so it's good to try to put yourself 
in, in their sandals, try to imagine what the sleeping conditions, the living conditions, the bathroom conditions, those types of things. Not trying to be gross, I just don't think we think about those things very often. They're not checking into the Hilton, the Holiday Inn, the Hampton, it's nothing like that. So, uh, so as I say, we're going to do a survey here, so let's start reading. Beginning here, verse 1, uh, after these things Paul departed from Athens, he went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. And so because he was of the same trade, he stayed, Paul stayed with Aquila and his wife Priscilla, and he worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. I mean, what are the odds of that? Think about that one. Jews who were, it doesn't say they were from Rome, they were from Italy. Now Claudius had, had expelled, it, it was by law, expelled all the Jews from Rome. There's too much trouble with them here, get rid of them, they gotta go. And so for whatever reason, uh, Quill and Priscilla also left Jews, but we find out they're also believers in Messiah. By the way, how did they come to faith in Christ? How'd they come to faith in Christ? Osmosis, probably not. How did they come to faith in Christ? What do you think? You're the word of God. How? When? Pentecost is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Pentecost. There, there were Jews in, in Jerusalem for the, for the Feast of Pentecost, and when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, they went back. Keep that in mind. We're going to circle back to that later on. Uh, the whole idea of Pentecost. That, that, Paul hadn't been to Rome. No one went to Rome as, a, as an apostle at this point. So anyhow, so, so they're, they're believing Jews. They've left Rome, and, and here they are, by coincidence, so to speak, um, in Corinth. And Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Shabbat, and he persuaded both Jews and Greek. By the way, six times you'll find their names, Aquila and Priscilla. Six times you're going to find their names in, in the New Testament. Um, five times their names are Aquila and Priscilla in one order or another, Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila, which is very interesting considering when this was written 2,000 years ago, men get the, the first, uh, first position. Um, so the sixth time is that Paul refers to her in uh, 2 Timothy 4 as Prisca, Prisca and, a, and her husband Aquila. So she's also known as Prisca. But of the six times then that they're mentioned, in, that Paul mentions them in the scripture, Three times it's Aquila and Priscilla. Three times it's Priscilla and Aquila. Some of you are thinking, survey, shmervey. He's not getting anywhere tonight if he keeps doing this stuff. But I'm telling you, that's significant. How so? Eh, we can look at that some other time, or especially as you go through uh, you know, Corinthians or something like that. But they have great influence, and that is to say that Priscilla, some would even say, I don't know if this is true, but some would even say that Priscilla had more gravitas, as she was the deeper in the word, deeper in the faith than her husband Aquila. I don't know how you prove that, except it's sort of by inference because of the 50% of the time she's mentioned first. Um, so that's, I won't beat that drum anymore, but I just think it's important that we, we understand that. So, uh, so Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, and Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews, this is in the, in the synagogue now, in Corinth. Um, and he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments. He wasn't going, ooh, that's not what he's doing. The idea is kind of like Jesus said, you know, you go to a house and they reject you, wipe the dirt off your sandals, right? And then move on. That's what he's doing. He's shaking out the dust. He's shaking out the dirt from them. Also significant, that hopefully I'll remember later on, but in terms of the handout, you might want to write that on there. Why does a Jew want to shake dust off one's feet? It's an interesting question. Why would God say to do that? Interesting question. At least I think so. Anyhow, um, so, so he said he shook off his garments. He said, your blood be on your heads. I'm clean. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. So he departed from there, and he walked around the corner, and he went into the house that was actually attached. They shared a wall, that's the idea. Um, the house of a certain man named Justice, one who uh, worshipped God, whose house was next door, uh, or hard, hard next door, hard fast, you, your scripture may say. Uh, 
to the synagogue. And then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. Interesting, you know, the, the, all those in the, in the synagogue, they rejected Paul, they rejected the gospel, even though Paul, if you think of who he is and think of what he's done so far, that from the scriptures, from what scriptures? From the Old Testament, from their scriptures, from the Hebrew scriptures, he's, he's demonstrating to them that this Messiah the one who was crucified, the final sacrifice, the Lamb of God who paid the, fr- the, the price for the sins of all the world and, and died and rose again the third day as was predicted in the scriptures. Look at Jonah. I mean, he, he would have gone through all these things and they would reject it. Think about that. Those who had the scriptures, who, knew, who should know the scriptures, they reject it. But this ruler of the synagogue, after all of that, he believed. And, uh, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, meaning Gentiles, they believed and they were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, said, do not be afraid, Paul, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. Now again, I think this is important. It's important because it's a, it's a good, it, it's good advice to every single one of us, because in one regard, this is exactly what the Lord is saying to you when you're afraid to speak up. Because there's a reason that Jesus would say to Paul, don't be afraid. What do you think that reason would be? He must have had fear, right? And so he says, don't be afraid. Uh, he said, uh, don't be afraid. Don't keep silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you. Why? I have many people in this city. Why I have many people? Not yet. They're not believers yet. But God knows who they are. He has many people in your city, too. He has many people in your neighborhood. He has many people where you work. He has them there already. Remember that. We'll come back to that later on. I keep saying this. I I probably will forget. You'll have to remind me. I keep saying it because this all connects back to something that I think is very important. We touched on it on Sunday, this idea that God, from one blood, made all the nations of the earth. He determined who you are. He determined when you would live, when your ancestors would live, where they would live, what the boundaries of their nations would be. He determined all those things. Nothing is by chance. So if that's true, there's something to be said there. There's something to be understood there in terms of where we are, who we are, what is the church, the ecclesia, this body that's been called out of the the world, principally at this point, most of us are Gentiles, called out from those nations into a separate nation, a family, a separate nation, with a purpose. What is the purpose? To go get them. To go get them. You and I are called to go get those people. You and I are called to go get those people who he has in that city, in your city, or in your home. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. We don't think about that very often. A year and a half Paul spends now in Corinth doing this. And when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and they brought him to the judgment seat. They said, this fellow, now understand what they're doing. The Jews, the synagogue, who, 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 who expelled him, they wanted nothing to do with this message. They had expelled him. Now they're ticked. That the, that the message is, is gaining traction. they got to do something. So they take them to law. They take them to the Gentile, to, to, to the proconsul there in, uh, in Achaia. With one accord, they brought Paul up against them, brought him to the judgment seat. They said, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law, not the law as in the, the civil law, their law, Jewish law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo, Gallio, not Galileo. He's a different guy, different time. Gallio said to the Jews, if it's a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be a reason why I should hear you. But, but it's a, if it's a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourself. I don't want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. It's like, this is, and, and this is a, a thing that sometimes we don't get, but the perspective of Rome at that point was that Again, we call it the church, or we call them Christians. That was, a, that was a handle they got when they were in Antioch. But they're still referred to as the way. And so they were considered by Rome, for the most part, as a sect of Judaism, and that there's some conflict that these people can't resolve. But it's their problem, not our problem. It's your problem. 
Go deal with it. So he drove him out. And then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, another ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Very merciful guy. So Paul still remained a good while. Remember, we're just doing surface here. We're just sailing through 30,000 feet. And then he took leave of the brethren and he sailed for Syria. And, uh, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. Can I have that same map back up, Mindy? Let's keep the second one up for now. So he leaves, he goes from Athens to Corinth. He goes down from Corinth, you can't really see it, but down to Centria. Now he takes off across going to Ephesus before he heads back to, uh, to Jerusalem. But he has his hair cut off there in Centria. All the uh, hairdressers live in Centria. And some people think they know why. Some people like to purport why. Paul had his hair cut off. Many people say, well, he took a Nazarite vow. Maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. It doesn't say that. Um, Josephus talks about uh, people who would take a vow for personal reasons, especially near the Passover. Not a Nazarite vow. They would just take a vow. They'd cut their hair off, they'd fast, you know, and they would go past the feast, and then they would grow it again. So we don't know. And it's not no reason to really concentrate on a whole lot or to make much about it. And when they asked him to stay longer with them, he didn't consent. But he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast. Passover, around 53, 54. I must keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. So what did he do? Okay, so... He's Ephesus, and now he goes to Caesarea, coastline. He goes up to Jerusalem. I know you know this. You're such a sophisticated bunch. But I want to remind you, wherever you go or wherever you are, it doesn't matter if you're in the Himalayas. If you're going, you could, you could be on Everest at almost 30,000 feet. Jerusalem is 2,700 feet. You still go up to Jerusalem. It is the spiritually highest point on planet Earth. From a Jewish perspective, having been there a number of times, I would say it's, it is the, the highest point. So it's always up to Jerusalem. So yeah, a lot of times we read up, down, we think north, south. No, they mean to upward spiritually because you're going up uh, to, to the mountaintop, to the, to the Jerusalem mountaintop. So... Um, he, he went up, he greeted the church. Imagine that. So he would have greeted you know, James and Peter. They would have hung for a while. We're not told how long. Uh, then he went down. So he, he went down. He went down the mountain, but he went up, as in north, to Antioch. Right? Um, and from there, if you could put up the, the other map, Mindy, um, now the third journey starts. So after he spent some time there uh, in Antioch. He departed and he went over the region of Galatia, Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So, you know, so he leaves here again, goes through Cilicia and through Galatia, strengthening the churches in, uh, in Galatia, goes through Asia, and now he's going to cross back over again, Philippi, you know, and all pretty much retracing his steps, going back down to uh, to, to Corinth, and then he's going to backtrack and come back again. Um, I know there was something brilliant I was going to say. I can't remember what it is now. But anyhow, um, I'm making fun of my own self. Don't worry about it. Um, so, so now he's gone through. I mean, think about this. It, the, the, he can't text ahead, say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Is there anything you want from Jerusalem while I'm up there? You know, I can get you some olive oil. You know, maybe you want some, you know, some good trinkets or something. Nothing like that. You know, not even sending him a letter, just, which is good. I mean, the bad guys are there too. He doesn't want to put them on alert. But imagine just showing up on a Sunday. You know, and it's like, oh, Paul's here. Uh, that would have been cool. Or, you know, seeing you know, Timothy's mother and his grandmother and uh, all of that. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, who was born in Alexandria, now they're in uh, the area of uh, Ephesus. We're not there yet, then we're speaking of Ephesus. A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now I want you to think about who this guy is. Um, 
all of the descriptions of Apollos, you would get the impression he was like tall, dark, handsome. Yeah. And by contrast, Paul seems to be a short guy. I mean, you know, by, when you consider all of the beatings he's gone through at this point, uh, the, you'd call him lumpy. You know, I mean, he, I don't know how he'd even shave. And, and you know, eyes seem to be weepy, you know, from the diseases that he's had. And so, you know, he's, he's been beaten up. Some people say he had a squeaky voice, you know. So in terms of, you know, Josh and I were just talking this today, about this today, about how people communicate from the pulpit. You know, some people are just natural communicators. Others don't have, or, or they're, they're skilled at it. They don't, so many people don't have the same other skills. But people like those things, right? So, you know, when Paul writes to the Corinthians later on, he says, you know, some of you say uh, I'm of uh, Peter. Some of you say I'm of Apollo. Some say I'm of Paul. Some of you say I'm of Christ. You know, uh, people were forming their divisions. And very often people form their divisions over what? In churches, what do they form their divisions over? I like the guy, he's a nice guy, he's my age. We, you know, we, 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 we click, you know, we click. Nothing wrong with clicking with people. Cliques, that's a different issue. But clicking, that's okay. Um, uh, I, you know, he said something once I really liked, he said something I didn't like, so I like him better. That kind of thing. People are fickle, not you, others. And, and so here's this guy, tall, dark, and handsome. He's from Alexandria. Think of northern Egypt, just north of Cairo. Alexandria was the second largest, right after Rome, second largest city in the empire. I want you to think about this. The library in Alexandria, 700,000 700, volumes. And they're not bound like this, not printed. Everything's hand scribed, scrolls. Think about that. And of course, imagine the, the, the disaster of the fire, right? Everything that was lost there. But here's a guy who's been educated there. I mean, this guy, you say, you know, what are your credentials? Well, I was at Princeton Semi-Logical, you know, and I went to this place, I went to that place, I went, you know, I, I've been there. And, and, and he's probably good looking, he's very eloquent. Man, you can get a crowd with someone like this. He was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. Now this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. And then and the suggestion, based upon the way the translators handle it here, is that not fervent in the Holy Spirit, just fervent, it's just this natural spirit, okay? Um, you know people like that. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord though he only knew the baptism of John. That's all he knew. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. That's the way to do it. You know, they didn't, they didn't stand up and say, I rebuke you. In the, that, I've seen that happen before. Uh, not here, I'm just saying. I've <laughs> I know of those kinds of stories, uh, but... You know, they, they took him aside, they, they brought him home, hey, would you like to have lunch with us, you know, stay at our place, and they explained things. And again, you know, come back to Aquila and Priscilla. I, I, this, is, this, is, this stands out to me. Prisca is, is a deacon, or you, you know, we use the language deaconess, but you know, deacons, people have a tendency to think deacons are always men. That, that's not so. Elders are always men. But there are deacons and deaconesses. We have them in this church, too. And I would say that's what, what Priscilla or Prisca was. And she seems to have some, some solid grounding in the word. And I'm not saying that she necessarily overshadowed Aquila. I mean, you know, it's, people, people want to infer a lot of things if I just stop there sometimes. But I, I think you have to deal personally with the fact that when you're looking at a document that was written 2,000 years ago in a Male dominant culture where m men are always listed first. And in half of the listings, she's listed first. That's interesting. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta consider that. So they both, they, they double teamed them. Um, so, so then he began to speak boldly in the synagogue and when Aquila Priscilla heard, oh, I already read that. And uh, when he desired to cross to Achaia, the the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures 
that Jesus is the Messiah. So he's a Jew and he proves it to them. And now it happened while he was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, he came to Ephesus and he found some disciples. So, now, so while this is happening, you know, ship the scene, Paul's making his way this way and he's coming through these churches over here. And, and he's visiting them. Actually, you know, the, the resolution's not great, but you can you probably have a map in, in your Bible. What are the churches that, that have already started there? Well, you can see them on a map, or you can read them in Revelation 2 and 3. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Sardis, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, you know, Colossae and Laodicea are very close to one another. That, that was the mail route. It was, it was interesting how the disciples went. They got saved in one place and they just moved along the road, the mail route, to all those different places. Hint, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what they did because they were alive and they wanted to do it. So that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and so he, you know, he visited with them, and uh, as he came to Ephesus, he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. I find this, I've always wondered about this. And far be it from me to tell you what to do. But I think you should too. You should wonder about this. What is it? that Paul saw or did not see in those disciples that he would ask that question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And his, their answer proved his question. We hadn't heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I want to know what, what Paul would say if he met us. Each of us has to ask that question. Is the presence, is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so evident that someone wouldn't have to ask that question? It would be evident that we did receive the Holy Spirit when we believed. And look, you can go off. I'm not doing it tonight because we're doing the survey. But you can go off from here into this whole question that we looked at in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 10 about uh, the baptism and the infilling and the overfilling uh, of the Holy Spirit and, and the necessity to Seek the filling. Each one of us is commanded, Paul writes it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, to be filled, to be seek, to be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time event. We're born, in, we're, we're born again once. We're baptized into the Spirit once. We're filled with the, or, 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 you know, we're, we're indwelt by the Spirit once. You can look at these one time. We're, we're, we're um, sealed with the Spirit once. They're one-time events. They don't happen again. But there's a fifth verb. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is a continual event. That's what the Bible says. That's a command. It's not an opinion from John Hessler. That's what the Bible says to us. That each one of us, as we start our day, as we begin things, you, you hear me pray when I come up here or when, when we meet as a, a worship team before we come out here, Lord, we want, we want your spirit to lead. We want you to be the one. We don't, we don't hardly know these people. You know what I mean? Um, we, we don't, who knows what's on anybody's heart in here but God himself, right? He's the one who's going to bring the increase. Anyhow, so... He said to them, uh, verse 3, then into what then were you baptized? And they said, well, into John's baptism. Paul explained, John in, indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to people that they should believe on him who would come after him, after him, that is, on the Messiah, Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues and they prophesied. And now the men were about 12 and all. And he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But some were hardened and they didn't believe and they spoke evil of the way before the multitude. And he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And th the thing about this, now Paul is going to be working full time. He, he's going to work. He's going to make his living while he's in Ephesus 
for um, what is, I guess, the better part of what, about three years. And, and while he's there, he works daily, and then he teaches, what, four hours, five hours a day? I don't, what, what do you think of this? I mean, they didn't work 40-hour weeks, by the way, in those days. And uh, they worked, if you did take a Shabbat, that was one day. Six days you worked, seventh you rest. It's not work five, 40 hours, you want to do four twelves, that's okay. Or, you know, uh, it wasn't like that, right? Nothing was union controlled. You just work because you had to make a living. And then he taught. Imagine what it would be like to sit under the Apostle Paul for two years, every day for five hours, how many hours that would be of your life to learn from the Apostle Paul. It was open to anybody. Paul's school in Ephesus. I think that's wild. It's just a wild thought to me. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, God worked unusual miracles not the usual garden variety type, whatever, I mean, a miracle's a miracle to me. But God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. I can tell you're not impressed at all. Did you read it? Yeah. Think about this. I mean, a miracle's a miracle. People, if a guy walked in here blind, and we prayed for him, and suddenly he could see... I don't think we'd all be sitting here like this, right? And then an unusual miracle, like, you know, if, if Eric Brown, you know, left his, left his sweat rag, you know, over in the other side, and someone picked it up and touched somebody who had, you know, a, a skin disease, and suddenly they were clean, I guess that's an unusual miracle, you know? We'd say, hallelujah, Lord, you're really at work here. But I don't think you believe in miracles. I don't think you believe that God does that stuff anymore, do you? See, I could tell you don't. What's he saying to us? I'm saying we read it and don't really take it seriously. We read it and don't really take it seriously. It's a story. Don't let it be a story. It's the truth. It happened and it exploded the ancient world. And you're here today because someone back then told somebody else who told somebody else who told somebody else who ultimately told you. And we're supposed to keep the chain going. That's the point. And God still works miracles. We've seen him do it around here. You may not have seen it in your life or in somebody else's life, but we've seen it around here. Seen it in our, our own personal experiences. We've seen it in the church's experience. We're not a miracle church like some people like to you know, promote themselves. But... God is the same today as he ever was. Don't ever forget it. And don't, I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm beating up me, and I don't mean to do that. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying because I'm coming across strong. But be careful not to mistakenly demean God. Be careful not to mistakenly demean God by just reading it as a story. We do that. We do it when we read devotionally. And we read it, and we do the same thing when someone teaches it to us. It's real. It really happened. And people gave their lives for this. And we're recipients of that. Verse 13, then some of the itinerant exorcists, some Jewish exorcists, uh, took it upon them, I took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you or we cast you out by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now there were seven sons of this Jewish priest called Sceva, which I think is a pretty funny name, but anyhow, who did, who did that. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and I don't think he said it like like, Jesus, I know. But Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Well, there, there, there are two different words. Jesus, I know. Paul, I'm aware of. In other words, I've been told, stay away from him. In, in a sense, it's a different verb. You, I don't know. 
Now, I, 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 I agree. I have like a junior high sense of humor here, but this is a total Three Stooges moment. Absolutely. It really is, because I know it's serious. But he says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Look, you gotta be, you got to be whooped to run outside naked, right? What would you do? You, what, what would be the cost for you to have to do something like that? These guys are like, whoop, 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 you're right. And they, they've got to have scratches and gouges and bite marks in them because here's one man empowered by this wicked spirit who's taken on seven men and wins. And they, and they flee. Don't ever, don't ever minimize the power of Satan. Nana Jesse used to say it all the time. Oh, John, Satan is a mighty foe, but God is almighty. <laughs> right, Nana? That's true. How can I pray for you? Um, Overpower prevailed against them. They fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known both to Greeks and Jews dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Think about it. If that happened, think about, how, think about it if it happened here. You know, and, and, and all the people who just sit and say, yeah, interesting. And suddenly we see something like that happen. Think of the number of people both in church and outside of the church who would start confessing their sins and getting right with God, realizing like, oh, this is really a lot more serious than I ever thought, right? And many who had practiced magic brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it, told, it, it totaled 50,000 Think about that, 50,000 pieces of silver, or 50,000 drachma, 50,000, uh, a, a piece of silver is a day's wage. Okay, so, so think of 50,000, whatever, uh, however many days a year, if it's six, uh, let's just call it 300 work days a year. Uh, you got about 170 men's worth of annual wage there. That's a lot, 170 years worth of wage right there. They burned it all because they realized something that a lot of us don't. Let me ask you a question. Very serious question. Every single one of you. What do we still hold on to from our life before? There's things sometimes we hold on to. Things that, you know, it's like I don't do that anymore, but, you know, I remember it. Those things, they get a hold of us or they keep a hold of us. We think, I, I, I can handle it. Four very dangerous words. I can handle this. It can be lust. It can be buzz. It can be all sorts of things. I can handle it. No, you can't. We think we can for a little while, but it's a hook. It's a hook in our heart, and it always brings us back to the wicked one. There's something at some point, and you know what it is, that we finally have to get rid of or we have, to, we have to draw the line. Whether we have to burn it, we have to get rid of it. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I remember Charlie. What was Charlie's name? Charlie. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Akovich. But Charlie, Charlie was here for a long time, lives over in Jersey. And he was a, he was a major drug dealer back in the day over in Jersey. Um, really knew his horticulture and he had he had refined it like a really great strain and uh and he had partners they had greenhouses that was the day and uh, you know watch yourself john um but he he was making money he and his partners were making money hand over fist and, and it was, quote, unquote, good wheat. It was like really well-known. People, he, his, his product was in high demand. He got saved. And he read this and he said, I just got to get rid of it. He, a thought went through his mind. Well, I can sell it at half price. I can give everybody a deal, <laughs> you know. And then he realized, I can't do that. I have to get rid of it. 
So he, he destroyed all the weed. Now, South Jersey, if you know what grows, all the stuff that grows in South Jersey, a very prolific area. That's why it's called the Garden State, you know? And uh, <laughs> when they named it the Garden State, they weren't thinking of this. But anyhow, um, uh, he, he, so he burned it. He destroyed the gear, all of that equipment. And his partners found out, like, what? <laughs> They're not the mob, but still, they, you know, like, what have you done? And what's that smell? Um, and he said, no, I got saved, man. The Lord is over my life. Well, it's ours too. He said, no, I just had to get rid of it. And he basically went on the run after that. But um, I just thought I'd mention that. Okay. You got you to gotta draw the line at some point. You know, right. as it goes on through here, and I'm just going to say it and move on. Um, finally, the church, Paul especially, but the church is brought to trial in the stadium. Now, the stadium's a big deal. Is, have any of you ever been to Ephesus, ancient Ephesus? Have you been there? Any of you? Couple, okay. Uh, it's like, it's breathtaking. When you see, when you see the, uh, the theater in, uh, in Ephesus, it, people estimate anywhere from 25 to 40,000 people could sit in it. This is an ancient theater. It took two, well, well the Temple of Diana took um, 200 years to build. 200 years to build. It, it's 25 times the size of the Parthenon. And, and Paul is called to the center of the arena on trial because Demetrius, who's the silversmith, says, this guy's bad for business. Because this guy says that Gods made by men are not gods at all. They're all in up in arms. Now, really, it was because he was cutting into their wallet, right? But he made a point, and you'd probably agree with it. Gods made with hands are not gods at all. Would you agree with that? Yes. But, you know, all the people worship Diana of the Ephesians. Great, you read the rest of this passage for yourself. They, they go on for two hours, two hours, thousands of people. Imagine 25,000 people, 25,000 voices. There's no, ampl there's no amplifiers back in that. 25,000 people yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Who's Diana of the Ephesians? We don't think about these things. How many of you studied mythology? when you were in junior high, high school, something like that. Come on, no one's honest? No one can, you can't lift your hands anymore? Come on. <laughs> How many people study mythology? Greek mythology, things like that? Okay. All make-believe, right? Just imaginations of people's minds? No. C.S. Lewis said it right. Every myth is rooted in a truth. Every myth is always rooted in a truth. You know, I, I dove into a little thing on Sunday that I, I want to talk with you a little bit about this evening. The handout that I gave you. Um, you can look at that if you want. You don't have to. But um, based upon what Paul says in his sermon, you know, his sermon in Athens, what does he say? He says that, God made every single person, no matter what color. It's just melanin. Right. Under the melanin, we're all the same, right? We're all made from one blood, Adam, right? He determined when you would live. He determined where you would live. He determined the boundaries of the nations, every single nation. God is the one, not men. Men fight over boundaries, but the boundaries we know of today in the nations are really artificial. They're, they're later in design. Governments, UN, people like that, you know, League of Nations, whatever they were. They were the ones who said, oh, no, from this point to that point, this point north latitude to this point over here. That's a different kind of a, a boundary. God is the one who established all the ancient boundaries. And I, I asked you at that time, and that's why this sheet is mostly questions 
and blank spaces because I, I want you to consider some of these things. Now, some of you may not want to. I mean, no one has to. It's not like you've got to turn in the homework. But I think it's worth our while to ask these questions. Why are some of these things that we read, particularly in the Old Testament, why are they there? Because I, I, I've learned over time that I don't ask that question enough. I get so used to reading it, I just say, oh, well, this is that and that and this, and, up, 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 and I go on. I suspect you're kind of like me in that regard. But that can be a dangerous thing to do. Because if it really is God's word, and it is, okay, but it, you know, if it is or since it is, well then, who are we not to take it with gravity? So there are questions we don't ask ourselves too much. For example, when the fall happens, and by the way, when I say the fall, what am I talking about? Chapter, name a chapter. Genesis, Genesis what? There are 50 chapters? Three. Are there other falls? Really? Are there? How many falls are there in Genesis? How many falls are there in Genesis? I suggest there's three. Now, Genesis chapter 3, who fell? Okay, Adam and Eve. Is that all? Is that all? Did anybody else fall? God didn't, so he's... No, 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 Genesis 3. There's the question. By the way, who's the serpent? Now, if you read, this, if you read Genesis 3 in Hebrew, it doesn't say, now the slithering snake said. Not a snake. We think snake. Because if you have children, you've bought children's books. And you've read it to them. And you all, we've all seen the picture of the snake in the tree. But it doesn't say it's a snake. In fact, the Hebrew said the nachash. Nachash. By the way, nachash, can you hear this? Yeah. No, what I'm about to say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Listen, listen carefully. Nachash. You hear the ch? Nachash. Nechush. Can you hear the difference? What's the difference? Ah versus ooh, right? But it's still n ah, Right? Nachash. Don't worry, I'm going somewhere here. Or nehushtan, right? Do you hear the same, I'll say, root in it? Nachash, nehush, nehushtan. Yeah. When the bronze serpent in the wilderness, remember? When the plague is going through the land and, and, and God tells Moses, you know, fashion a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and anybody who looks to the bronze serpent will be healed. Right? Jesus refers to that in John chapter 3. Just as, as Moses lifted the serpent high in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up that all who look to Him will be saved. So it was, it was a picture pointing forward to Christ, right? That's what I say. Almost every page in the Old Testament is really pointing to Christ. Okay, so but that serpent, the, the bronze serpent, is a nechush nachash. In other words, it's a nachash, a serpent, that's nechush, it's made of bronze. It's a simple language in one sense, Hebrew. And later on, that bronze serpent is put into the Ark of the Covenant. It's Hezekiah many centuries later who finds that the people are actually worshiping the bronze serpent that's in the Ark of the Covenant, and he takes it out and smashes it to smithereens. And he says, Nehushtan. In other words, it's just a piece of bronze, is what he's saying. So now, Genesis 3, the Nachash. What is this thing? What's the Nahash? Most people will, will translate it as the shining one. So don't think snake. Okay, don't think snake. You see, Eden is a holy place. We don't think of it that way. We just think cool garden. But it's a holy place where God dwells with his creation man. If you think that Lucifer fell before Genesis 3, there's something you got to work through here. How'd that guy get in here, into the holy place? Or if you think he fell later, 
then how'd he get away with doing this thing? No. You could better make the case that the fall was two parties. Adam and Eve, I'll treat as one party. And Satan, it's just a suggestion. I think I'm right. But just, it's just a suggestion, okay? No, I'm just saying I think it makes sense, okay? I'm not trying to... Yeah, I am having fun with you. But yeah, so I'm serious, but let's have a little fun, okay? Uh, because I, I, you know me, I can really give you a headache if I wanted to. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to give you a headache. I want you to think differently. It's good to think outside of the box about things that we think are in the box, but we don't understand it the way God designed the box. There's things in the box we don't understand sometimes, and it's good for us to look at them in a different way. We get into Genesis chapter 4, Phil mentioned Cain and Abel, that's what happens there. And then Abel dies and we read about the, you know, the whole civilization of Cain, but that last verse in chapter 4, it says that um, Adam knew his wife again and had a son named Seth. Seth means appointed because God said one would come, be appointed from whom the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, the seed, the seed of the head of the serpent. So they named him Seth, appointed one. And Seth had a son named Enosh. And in his days, whose? Enosh's days, men began to call on the name of the Lord, it says. That, that's a standard reading that we get from the Masoretic text. By the way, the Masoretic text, again, no, no headaches, just hear me out, okay? The Masoretes were a group of Hebrew scribes who wanted to preserve the Hebrew language after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They feared, wait a minute, millions of people have died here. There's blood in the streets. And the rest have gone to all the nations. So how will our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, read the Word of God? Because Hebrew, you people have told you before, right? Hebrew is, it's all consonants. If you don't know what they mean, it's a spoken language. You could take English and take all the vowels out. You'd be able to read it because you have a spoken language. That's how they understood Hebrew. To us, it's like, yee, yeah, how do you do that? And all the letters kind of look the same anyhow. But no, they could do it because they already spoke the language. But how will their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren know it? So they came up with a whole system of dots and diddles and all these things around those consonants, vowel sounds, so that one could teach his children how to pronounce the words. So the Masoretes rescribed the entire Bible. It's called the Masoretic Text, MT, capital M, capital T. You see it in your footnotes a lot of times. But it's basically 700 AD. My word, that's 700 years after Christ that they wrote that. Your most reliable translation is actually the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew, which is 300 years before. So certain things you won't find in the Masoretic text, you will find in the Septuagint. And some of those variant readings, like chapter 4, verse 26, in the Masoretic text and in your English translation, it says, in those days men began to call on the name of the Lord, but in the variant readings, it will say, men began to profane the name of the Lord. Now, whoa, that's different. Calling the name of the Lord sounds like I'm praying. Profaning is profaning, right? Interesting. Anyhow, so something's happening here. Why is that important? Why, do we, why are we given that information? Did you ever ask yourself that question? I don't think we ask ourselves that question sometimes. Why is that supposed to be important to us? I guess that was important to some rabbis a long time ago, but after all, I'm a Christian. What difference does it make? It's the history of planet Earth. It's the history. Well, what is the Bible? The Bible is God's Revelation, you can disagree with me on everything else. This you have to agree with me on. What is the Bible? The Bible is God's revealing. It's his revelation of his plan to redeem all mankind back to himself. Okay? You with me? If that's true, and it is, then every word, every place name, every number, every punctuation point in the original is there by divine design. Now you can think that's over the top, Hessler. No, you missed the, you missed, you missed the, you missed the foundational point. It's God's revelation of his plan to redeem mankind. And if that's so, everything is by design. 
And if it's so, then chapter four is meaningful. Chapter five is meaningful, and we read about the 10 generations from Adam to Noah. Chapter six is meaningful when we're told in chapter six that, look at it, chapter six. Yes, we'll end on time. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, and we've been through this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time justifying my points, but sons of God are angels. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took, lachach in Hebrew means to take by force. They took wives for themselves of all whom they choose. The Lord said, my spirit won't strive with man forever. He's flesh, his days shall be 120 years. There were giants, or Nephilim, there are two different ways of translating that. Giants were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, interesting, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children to them. These were the mighty men, take a, take a pen, circle mighty men, and write gibor, G-I-B, act like B-B, G-I-B-B-O-R, Gibor. A Gibor can mean sometimes cool dude, big dude, you know. But in this context, early on, this is not like that. These are scary big dudes, not just big in stature, but scary in intentions, okay? Is this a fall, would you say? When you consider that the reason for the flood was that the entire race of mankind had been affected by this. And that, and that we read over in, in chapter 6, verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. He was a just man. He was perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. He was perfect in his generations. It doesn't mean he was a perfect man. We know he's a sinner. What made him perfect? Tamim in Hebrew means he was, he was not affected. He was un, untainted, you could say, by what was happening in that society. So from the days of Enosh, when men began to profane the name of the Lord, I would suggest, that's, my, that's just an opinion, but from that time early on until this point, this phenomenon is spreading across the earth. A total of 1,600 years, by the way, if you go through the generations in chapter 5 until God says, I have to scrub the earth. Why? Because everybody, with the exception of Noah, his sons, and their four wives, Noah's wife and his son's three wives, everybody was affected, which means they were unredeemable. Unredeemable. You with me? It's not something they could do to get back to God, because they weren't, they were hybrids. They weren't fully human anymore. You can think, this is sci-fi. He's just getting ready for, ho for, for Halloween. No, no, no. It's in the Bible. I'd call this a fall, wouldn't you? If Genesis 3 is a fall, and it is, is this not one? Yeah. You betcha. Who fell? Who fell? Mankind. All mankind. Anybody else? The Anybody else? The yeah. The guy behind it. Why did it happen? Because Lucifer said, all right, can't beat him, we'll join him, right? Do it a different way. I'm not here to beat the drum on and on. Again, I'm not here to give you a headache. I just want you to think, oh, I don't always look at it this way. Actually, and I would say, Genesis 6 is so fundamental to the Bible. It's fundamental to really understanding the whole flow of, of the narrative of the Bible. It's fundamental, in my opinion, to understand the way in which Christ is coming back, what eschatology is, what God's plan is, you've got to understand what happened here. My opinion. I'm not here to give a headache. You can choose not to believe it. Time goes on. The flood, ark comes to rest in the mountains of Ararat in the 17th day of the seventh month, which is the day of the resurrection in commemoration in advance, by the way. So the new start in Noah happens in advance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the same day, the 17th day of the seventh month. It was called the seventh month then on the, what would be the civil calendar, but on later on what the Jews would call the 
religious calendar, it would be called Nisan, the 17th. When, was, when did Jesus pay the price for your sins? Passover. What day is Passover? 14th day of the first month of Nisan. How many days was he in the tomb? How many of you know that? About a third. Okay. So <laughs> what's the third day after the 14th? 17th. So the 17th day of the seventh month in, chap in chapter 8 of Genesis is, is speaking of the exact same day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not here to give you a headache, just pointing it out to you. So chapter 8, you get into chapter 9, government is established, no capital punishment, all these things God says, go, be fruitful, multiply, spread across the earth, spread across the earth. You see it said a couple of times. We come into chapter 10. I said last week, not everybody knows it, but many, many of your Bibles will even give it to you in a heading, Table of Nations. Why? There are three people who come off that ark who are the progenitors of all the people who live on planet Earth. They are Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, Japheth. And chapter 10 gives you all of their sons and the sons' sons, in some cases, who started, whose families became the nations. Those names are always used in the Bible. We speak of Libya. God calls it Put. We call it Ethiopia. God calls it Cush. So if you want to know what's happened, you got to understand those ancient names, okay? So you have, the, you have the table of nations. You don't think of those people as nations because they're big families at that point. They might be 100, 200, 500 people. You don't think a nation. They might be 1,000, 10,000. You don't think a nation, but they're going to be. But they're all in one place. Now, this, this part is debatable for some people. This is just the way I see it. You don't have to. You know, there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting phrase that's used in chapter 11, because chapter 10 tells you all these people. We read in verse 8 of chapter 10 that Cush begot Nimrod, Nimrod, Nimrod. Marad in Hebrew means to, like, like, a, like a marauder. Okay, someone who destroys, someone who rebels, someone who, you know, kicks over all the toys, right? A marauder. The n in front of it means we will. We will rebel. That's his name. I don't think his parents said, he's not he cute, we're going to call him the little marauder. I don't know, I don't think that. But that becomes the handle he gets later on. By the way, he's also called a mighty one. Two times he's called a gibor. There's something else cooking here. There's something else cooking here. There's something spiritual cooking here. God said, spread across the earth. He said, uh uh go east, plains of Shinar. And, and he began, because he's a mighty one before the Lord, and he begins to influence everybody to move toward the east, toward Shinar. Let's build a temple to God. Not to go up to God. We think there's steps to go up to God. No, it's for God to come down to them. That's the intention. You think, well, doesn't God want to be with his people? Not on those terms. He's got, he's got his own way of doing this, right? Now, we read about that when we get to chapter 11, but we're told who he is in chapter 10. Now, he's the one who does this when we get to chapter 11. And by the way, we read in chapter 11 that this is happening. Well, we read in chapter uh, 10, uh, verse 25, that to Eber were born uh, these two uh, sons. Uh, the, they seem to be twins. But, um, but one of them is named Peleg. Peleg is used seven times in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible. It translates as earthquake. And it says, he was born in the days when the earth was divided. Two things are happening in my opinion. I said, in my opinion. This is happening at He's born during the time of what happens at Babel, when the languages are divided, right? When God corrupts all the language. They had one language. He says with one language, they can accomplish anything they want to. So I'll confuse their languages. But also, there was one time when the earth was one supercontinent. You can look at the map of the world and see that it's all a jigsaw puzzle. And, and you know, tectonic plates, you learn about that in high school, right? We're all moving apart. And so, just an opinion. It seems that at least the real evidence of that was being experienced 
for mankind at that time, at the same time as Babel occurs. And so, so God confuses the languages at Babel. How did that happen? Would you call that a fall? In a sense, would you call that a, a, a type of fall in chapter 11? God says, do this. They say, no, 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 we're going to do that. All mankind, in a sense, said, no, we're going to do this instead. And who's behind it? We say one man. No, no, he's a gibor. Something's cooking here. I would suggest that's all it is. It's just a suggestion that there's more happening behind the curtain here. And you'd have to think that if you believe in a wicked one, you've got to know he's behind it. Just as he's behind everything that's happening in, in all the, the, the nations on planet Earth right now. You've read Daniel chapter 10. Daniel says, I was praying for, for 21 days. And, and, and then Gabriel came and he said, Whew, man, I was fighting the prince of Persia for 21 days and I, I couldn't prevail. But Michael came and rescued me. Michael is the prince over Israel. He's the prince, a prince, not a, not, a, not a human prince. He's an angelic prince. Remember, why does Paul say in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the dark world. Why does he say that? By the way, have you ever thought of those words? Principalities, powers, rulers. Those are like geopolitical type, or I say cosmic geopolitical types of words. There are territories. We don't think of the ether, or the spirit world as territories, but Satan sure does, right? And, I would say, there are, are these principalities that have been assigned. So in Daniel chapter 10, we meet two of them right there. And, 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 and Gabriel says, Michael rescued me from, from fighting against the prince of Persia. Now I have to go and battle against the prince of what? Greece. Greece wasn't even on the scene yet. And he said, I have to go do this thing. The prince of Greece was already there. You tracking with me? Yeah. We don't look at it this way. And when we do, we tend to look at it through a sliver, but we don't look at it as a narrative. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Not trying to give you a headache. Mm -hmm. I just want you to get a sense of the playing field because we don't see the playing field. We think this is the playing field. Uh, it's just a sliver. There's so much beyond there. And I'm not trying to be booey wooey with you. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying there's so much more. So real quick. Um, and I, I asked a question on, on Sunday. You read through 70 nations here in, in chapter 10. 70 nations in chapter 10. Then we read about the Tower of Babel where God says, I'm going to confuse their languages. And they all, their, their languages are confused. So think about this. Languages are confused. You're used to speaking Hebrew, now you're speaking some other language that's actually French or it's actually Spanish or it's actually German or it's actually Akkadian or whatever it is. And it's like, uh, no, not, 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 oh, okay, we communicate. And you go off with those people while the, the turf itself is changing and you're moving with them. By the way, have you ever asked yourself, when you look at the Zodiac, and you shouldn't, If you look up your sign every day, you should repent. But that's, that's a, if you, if you will, it's, it's a corruption. It's a corruption of something, of, the, of God's plan of salvation that he put in the stars. We read about it in Job. His plan of salvation begins with Virgo and ends with, have you ever seen Orion? You ever looked at Orion? Okay, you, you probably don't know much about it because the constellations themselves are kind of weird if you think about them. But what is Orion? Orion is the great hunter, warrior. You know him by the three stars. You see it in the winter. You can't see him in the summertime in this hemisphere. But if you look, don't take my word for it, look it up for yourself. What's he doing? He's crushing the head of a serpent. It's the God's gospel plan right there. But there's, there's a corruption of that plan that's called astrology okay as if you know when you were born determines who you are uh, the planes that were flying over the hospital when you were born had more gravitational effect on you than something like that okay that's just bone but anyhow so but some people believe that it's silly where to come from have you ever noticed that on every continent of the world people believe that 
Why? Where'd that come from? Who told them? Ah, it started the plains of Shinar. Languages were corrupted. The land started to move, and they all took those corrupted ideas with them. Just an opinion. I'm not trying to give you a headache. But I asked you a question on Sunday. Chapter 12. Chapter 12, God says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, leave Ur the Chaldees, leave your family, leave your father's house, go to a land that I'm going to show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Why does God need a 71st nation? To be a light to the other nations. Yeah. But why? What was wrong with the other nations? They rebelled. Three times you're out. I, you know, I don't want to say he's just three strike, you're out. I, but it seems that way, okay? And so you can make the case that God said, no, that's it, ball game. I mean, if you would, you don't have to, but I, I suggest you do. Take a look at something, Deuteronomy 32. By the way, this has become a very popular thing lately. It's always been in the Bible. It's just that in recent years, a lot of people talk about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Well, it's right here. It is a worldview. It's, not, it's biblical theology. It's not systematic theology. It's, it's, it's a theology that you get from reading the Bible, which is the best theology you can have. Okay? Systematic theology is written by theologians with lots of letters after their names. Biblical theology is what you infer from reading the Bible. What does he say? You can read the whole chapter for yourself. But verse 8, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he, went, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. The Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Now, just to tell you something, he set the boundaries of the peoples, just like Paul said in that Acts 17. He set the boundaries of the peoples. If you have ESV, it says something different than it says in my Bible. My Bible said he set the boundaries of the nations according to the sons of Israel. If you just think through the logic of that, we don't have time to go through it tonight. We can talk about it if you want to talk about it afterward. But it's illogical to think that it could be the, according to the sons of Israel because they just came out of Egypt when, when he's saying this and, and the separation of the nations had happened centuries earlier. So how could that even be? No. ESV actually gets it right. The Septuagint translation written 300 years before Christ gets it correct, which is he set the boundaries according to the number of the sons of God. Oh, so angelic host. What does that mean? Well, we see it in Daniel chapter 10. There's angelic host over all the nations. By the way, just go back sometime and read Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. And so uh, all the heavens and the earth were completed, and all the host of them. What's all the host of them to you? To the average person, it's and all the stars. People tend to think all the host is all the stars. No. Host is sabaot in Hebrew. Sabaot means armies. They're armies. All, all the heavens and the earth were completed, and all the armies. What armies? Not, not men's armies angelic armies. All of that was created, and God rested on the seventh day. So, he's saying here, he did that. One last thing. And this is not designed to, I keep saying I'm not trying to give you a headache, but I guess I am. Um, this one, a commonly misinterpreted psalm, Psalm 82. You should look at this, and then we'll end. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. Wait a minute. Where is a congregation of the mighty in which, like within which, God can stand? Is this mighty generals? Mighty kings? Mighty rulers over planet Earth? Mighty heads of corporations? And the Most High stands among them? Work the logic. 
Does that make sense to you? God stands in the congregation of the mighty. God judges among the gods. By the way, and if you look that up, God's Elohim. See, remember, our God, who we call Elohim, he's the Elohim over all Elohim. El means God in Hebrew. Elo is another way of saying God, or two Elohes, two. Elohim, we talked about him, Elohim, and we use a third person masculine singing. We say he, Elohim, he did this, okay? But it's a very common word. God is not his name. Yehovah is his name. Our God is the God over all gods, but there are other gods. Not greater, but God established them. I know that doesn't always sound right, but he did, because that's what the scripture says. And so he stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, he says? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They don't know. They don't understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, this is Jehovah speaking, I said, you are gods. All of you are children of the Most High. He's not speaking to men. He's speaking to these angels. But you will die like men. Think of what Satan's end is and all those who want to follow him. You will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth. You will inherit all the nations. I know this is, inher- this is interpreted some way as if these are the ancient judges of Israel and God's calling them gods. Does that make sense? Think through the logic. God stands among all the ancient judges of Israel and says you're gods? No, that's not what he's saying. He's actually talking about what I just said to you. I've said 15 times so far, I'm not here to give you a headache. I want you to try to get a quick sense of the breadth of this. And again, let's come back to Acts 2. What happens in Acts 2? People from all those nations where Israel had been scattered from the diaspora are in Jerusalem, and he gives them the gospel. Why? Go get them. Because God's saying, I have people in every nation. I have people on every continent. And I've called you. He called Israel. He said, you're to be a light to the world. But they blew it. Why do you think they did this? Remember Naaman the Syrian? Remember Naaman the Syrian? Uh, Second Kings, right? He, He comes... And, and, you know, and he's got leprosy, and then the servant girl says, you know, go to the private Elisha, you know, and he'll tell you what to do. And then, so he goes, and, and Elisha doesn't even look at him. He just sends him a message, tell him dip seven times in the Jordan. And, and he gets ticked off, yeah. ticked off. Like, you know, I, I, we got mighty rivers where I come from, you know. And, and one of his people says, look, if he told you to do some mighty thing, you would have done it. So do what he said. So he does, he gets healed. And then he, you know, total brain switch. What does he say to Elisha later on? Look, I'm going back. I'm kind of an important guy. You know, I've got to take care of the king when I'm there. Do you mind if I take as much dirt as my mules can carry so that when I go back into the temple of Ramon, I can can sprinkle some dirt? Why does he want dirt? Because Israel is holy. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? There is. But there is a piece of land called Israel. It's not just the people. It's the territory itself that God has called his own. And you can say, well, he's just being really superstitious. I don't know. When Jesus says, wipe the dirt off your sandals, when someone who rejects, there's something there. I don't want to make too much about it. I'm just saying there's more to it than we think a lot. And we think we're sophisticated Westerners. And we don't think like ancients. doesn't mean they're dumb. They just saw things differently. But the message to us is, he told Israel, you're the light to the nations. But they said, no, that means we're special. And they're, ooh. So he said to us, no, you're the light of the world. Now you go do it. I have people in every nation. I have people on every continent. Go bring them the truth. That's what we're called to do. Sorry to keep you so long. Let's stand together.